Um, I'm really, um, really excited to be asked back by you guys. It's great to see you all. Um, it's winter here and it was snowing today, which is pretty unusual. It's a little bit late for that, but that's why I've got this jacket on and it's seven o'clock at night. I wish I could stay for some of the other presentations, but, but I, won't, I won't stay for too long because I've got an early start for work tomorrow. Um, a little bit about me and just that conversation about accidents and near misses. It's, um, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot and I was the coordinator or the, the co-editor of a website called the Australian Accident Register for, for about 10 years where we were trying to co collect um, information on accidents and near misses from recreational roping activities. Slacklining didn't really exist at that point, well, not formally, um, but, you know, rock climbing, abseiling, canyoning, all that sort of stuff. Oh, I should just say also thank you very much for um, allowing me to speak in English. I feel like feel like a, a rather ignorant person because I mean I speak enough French, but but um, yeah, I really appreciate being able to present in English. So thank you very much. But um, look, I, I really struggle with the question: Is it some weird human voyeuristic tendency that we just want to know what happens, or do we genuinely want to learn from the from the outcome of what happens? And look, I won't talk about this for too long, but um, the, the accident, the accidents in North American mountaineering, I used to buy that book every year and read it as a mountaineer and as a climber because, and often I'd read these stories and think, fuck, you know, oh, sorry, this is being recorded. I should watch my language. You know, I'd, I'd read this book and think, wow, um, I've been on that route and I set up my belay in the same place, the same way. And I got away with it, but these guys didn't. And one of them got really badly hurt or worse, you know. So I think if there's obvious lessons that can be drawn from things, that's really important. But look, I'll, I'll jump straight into, um, because I'm going to be talking about equipment specifications and testing. Um, I, had a, I had a very bad accident less than a year ago. Um, I think it was in October when I was doing a drop test. Um, and I've done hundreds of drop tests in the last 10 years. Because And I was particularly interested in um, the strength of Dyneema slings like this one here and what happens if we, if we put them in other configurations around pieces of hardware because a lot of us know that Dyneema has a relatively low melting point. Um, and if I girth itch it around a, a, an object and I apply that force slowly, it's going to break at a certain value. But if I was to do a drop test, that heat, it has to go somewhere a lot more quickly in, in that dynamic event. Um, and even though that might be a 22 kilonewton sling, and typically I'll say let's halve that any time we put any knot there, if it's a dynamic event, what you know, how much more is it reduced in dynamic, which has a lower melting point? Um, but look, I uh, um, I've done so many of these tests, you know, and I'm fairly comfortable with the way I conduct these. And normally I have my high point set up with a load cell at the top. And I lift the load up to that load cell and then I drop it down with a, a release mechanism. And I've, I've got a really well-contained drop tower and I know where my safe areas are and where I shouldn't be um, if, you know, if I'm worried about things moving around. Um, and I have, you know, extra equipment in place to, to soften that catch and all these sorts of things. But, look, I had to extend the load cell down to a lower point. So I'd normally do this with a chain and quite a heavy chain. Um, because it's very low stretch, so I don't want to I don't want to lengthen the time of that impact if I have a stretchy element above that load cell, so a heavy chain, um, and then put my load cell, and that allows me to lift the load above the chain and then drop to generate a higher force. Um, the language of fall factors it's something I struggle with, but you, you, you sort of see. So this time I did the test, but because um, I wanted to use a slightly different setup. I used a different chain. Like the, the chain I've used all these other times, I know the length of it and I know the pendulum through which that chain can swing in the worst case and where I need to keep my body out of the way. Well, um, I've written in this accident report up on, on my web website in quite a lot of detail. And look, I'm, I'm very human and I made a really poor error. Um, I, I assumed I knew so much about this system and I was completely safe and that nothing would go wrong. Um, but what has happened is as the load has fallen, as it's come in, it's been slightly off centre and it's whipped the chain sideways. The sling has then broken. And then 
a shackle this size has come up and it's fortunately it's on a pendulum swing and it's hit me in the face here and it's actually smashed my glasses and broken my cheekbone in three places. I was very lucky that it was on a pendulum, so it was on the way past. It didn't hit me straight on. That was more than 20 kilonewtons of force to break that sling. And it's and then um, I, I don't, not, like I didn't get that. Unfortunately, I haven't got the video, you know, and I missed the recording on the load cell <laughs> because then I really could have had some good science out of it. But, you know, I was, was I lucky? Um, yeah, for sure I was lucky. Um, if I had my head further forwards, it probably would have gone straight through my skull and I'd be dead today. But it's really simple. Um, I'll put a link. I mean, my, my website, Rope Lab, you can find it, and it's on the free section where I discuss that in a whole lot more detail. I haven't got the bad pictures that I didn't show my mum <laughs> with all of the bruises, and I think I had 20 stitches around here and here and here, and, like, I'm really lucky that, that everything's recovered now. I didn't require surgery. Um, but it, it leads me into into what I want to talk about. Um, so, look, I, I'll just just a couple of other things with the introduction. Yes, um, I've I've had an accident. Um, I've had many near misses um, in in ten years full time as a mountaineering and rock climbing instructor and guide. Fortunately, I never killed anyone, but I came close a couple of times, and I'm human enough to admit that I've made those mistakes. Um, fortunately, no one else suffered as a result of those. Their experience mightn't have been as positive as it could have been, but but I, I hope I've learned from those mistakes. Um, and one of the things of all of the accidents and near misses that I've read about, it seems that beginners and the most experienced people are the most likely to have accidents. The people in the middle range of experience who really know that they don't know everything are the ones least likely to have accidents. Okay, so if you're motivated enough to be here in this presentation, you're probably more at that experienced end. Um, and, and I really need to say, it's like, be humble. Don't relax like I did and think, yeah, I know about this stuff. It's okay. You know, it's every single time. It doesn't matter who's there. Every question should be valid. Um, I always have to disclose in presentations, at the moment I'm the Vice President of SPRAT, the Society of Professional Rope Access Technicians, Anything I say here has got nothing to do with Sprat, but of course, I'm me and I can't separate my different involvement with the things that I do. So <clears throat> I just always try to make a, a point of um, making that really clear. Um, Arata and Sprat are the two biggest certifying agencies for, for rope access technicians um, in, in the world. Um, I'm also involved not officially on any standards committee, um, but uh, I uh, I'm regularly ask for advice for input on European norms um, from those standards committees, um, such as the new standard that's in draft at the moment for static ropes that the UIA is working on. Um, Australia doesn't have a member, a member association of the UIAA, so I'm not eligible officially for, for membership anyways, which is fine because theoretically it doesn't snow here and we don't have mountains, I guess. But <laughs> anyways, um, look, let, let's move on to, on to the, the topic of what I want to talk about. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about you guys, but look, I'm really looking forward to getting this new load cell that I stumped up some money, the, the line scale. I'm really looking forward to getting a hand, my hands on that and being able to use it for some things. Um, and I have to say, and I'm just going to switch over to the other camera that I've got here. When I first started doing tests, this was the load cell that I was using, right? It's definitely a science experiment. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've got a, an electric, electrical engineering qualification and I know what to do with this end and what these numbers mean to use this to get information out of it. But I have to write software for it and I have to build electronics to, to do that as well. Um, there are many other kinds of load cells out for a long time, but then this one, this one came out from Rock Exotica. Um, and, look, I had a little bit to do with that as well. Rock Thompson from Rock Exotica is a genius when it comes to designing the hardware. He's not so good with the electronics. So it's one of the few products at Rock Exotica where they had to give um, that part of the design to someone else to do the work. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, that, that person still owns the intellectual property for, for what's inside here and the disappointing performance of the app and, and the way it works or doesn't work with, with the, 
you know, the devices that you connect to that. However, this was so exciting when it came out because for the first time it meant that you could just attach a carabiner to each end of this and use it in our systems and, and, and observe results and, and interpret information from them. Um, I'm reminded of something that, that I try and talk about with my kids often. At this time in, in our existence, we have accessible to us more information than we have ever had before. But for some reason, we seem less capable of making decisions appropriately, yeah? So as we collect this information, it's really important to, one, plan how we collect it, and two, use that information to make appropriate decisions. Um, I would strongly advise that um, you don't launch straight into doing dynamic tests. You don't go straight into doing drop tests where you, you know, producing an unquantifiable amount of force or tension that you're putting on this and of the energy that needs to be disposed of to bring um, Now, even if they're slow pull tests, um, people who work with, with all-terrain vehicles and four-wheel drives, they know about the hazards of winching to recover vehicles. And if that winch cable snaps, what happens to all of that energy? And do we have anything to dampen or dissipate that energy so that people are not in the line of fire and hopefully don't repeat my accident? Um, it, you know, it's very important to think about that kind of things. Like generally you're using people to pull on the system or some winch or something that, and you, it's hard to avoid being in that line of fire. So do anything you can to avoid that. It's, um, you know, I thought I was doing everything I needed to and I nearly killed myself doing one of these tests, yeah? Um, I've got two teenage sons and a beautiful wife that I nearly didn't come home to that day. Like, it's that serious. Um, so when it comes to the load cells, um, look, I'll just talk really quickly because um, I've, I've got this graph here. Oh, I should put this up first. This is a QR code. Is that written backwards on your screen? No, it's just because I've got it mirrored on mine, I think. There's a QR code and a link there. Um, this, this is a 130-page document on my website, which download, read, copy, whatever you want from it. You know, it's, um, it's, it's all of the technical stuff that I talk about on my courses. It's not a book. I'm terrible. Um, I'm not good at writing things down, and my language isn't great, but all of the science and all of, the, all of that sort of stuff is in there. So... It's basically roclab.com.au slash files slash physics. Um, or Thomas has just put up another, another link there as well. I'm not sure if the link's in there for in that free section, but files slash physics.pdf, it's certainly there. I'll type it up when I finish, but there's the QR code as well. Um, and any questions or mistakes in there, please ask. The only thing I do ask is that you don't republish that anywhere else because it's a live document and I update it at least once a year with corrections or new information. But it will always exist, the current version of that link, um, while I'm alive and, and keep that, that website running. <clears throat> so the load cells, when, we, when we're using them to collect information, um, one of the biggest errors that people make with dynamic tests is the concept of sampling rate. There's two things we need to think about. One is sampling rate and the other is resolution. If I have this load cell here, and some of you might have heard me tell this story before, a good friend of mine when he was flying to Europe with all of his climbing gear was checking in at the airport and they said, well, no, your bags are actually 25 kilograms. So therefore you have to pay two kilograms of excess baggage. And Chris said, but I weighed my bag with this and it says it's only 23. And, and then the, the person at the checking counter said to him, so show me the calibration certificate for that and tell me what the resolution of the device is. You know, it was the perfect response. And he just paid his money for the excess baggage. Yeah. Um, so this, it, 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 it's good for, you know, to, to measure things um, like up to 20 kilonewtons. And to be able to, to measure something that big, like you don't use a, a very small ruler to measure something which is 20 kilometres long. You use a rollout tape measure that only has the marks every one centimetre maybe, yeah? So I don't use this to measure values under 20 kilograms of, of mass. 
I'm just not going to get that accuracy. It might be plus or minus 10 kilograms is the, the results I get from that. Okay. Um, the other thing I won't be able to do that with that is, is break that carabiner because that, that's 23 kilonewtons to break that carabiner. Um, if I exceed 20 kilonewtons on this device, it will permanently it'll display that it's been overloaded and I shouldn't really be ever hanging people off that. Sorry, we've just lost focus there. Um, or using it for, for other, other tests. So the resolution and the full scale is important, but the other is the sampling rate. And this is this has occurred from a real test. And just move stuff out of the way. What I've done is I've got a, a 75 kilogram steel mass on a one meter piece of rope with a figure of eight knot at each end. Um, and then I've dropped that um, one meter. So from next to the load cell to below it. And what you can see here is predictably from zero load during free fall, it then comes on. We get this peak and then it comes down in a trough. So it, it's hit hard and then it bounces back up in the air, completely in the air and unweights the system. It unweights the system here. Sorry, I was just off the page. Um, I'll just zoom out a little bit. Um, and then as it's falling back down again, it puts weight on the system again, and then eventually we're left with the mass suspended on the system. Now, what I've got, and it's a little bit hard to see, but if I sample this event at five samples per second, at five hertz, then I actually get one sample here, one sample here. So I actually miss the first impact altogether. Another sample here, another sample here, another sample here, here and here. And then when I look at my load cell afterwards, it's only sampling at five hertz, five samples per second, it would tell me that the peak force during that drop was 1.66 kilonewtons. If I had to sample at 20 hertz, at least I would have got this peak at 6.15 kilonewtons. That's, and then if I take this section of the curve and I zoom in to, to here, and this, this, this graph is in the notes uh, in, the, in that, that book that I just gave you the link for. Um, now if I zoom in more, here's my 6.15 kilonewtons. Um, sampling at 100 samples per second are these marks. So the peak would be 12.37 kilonewtons. Sampling at 500 samples per second, I get a peak of 12.45 kilonewtons. So it's like looking at the high-speed video replay to see if the guy caught the ball or the ball bounced on the ground beforehand. You need enough frames, you need enough samples to be sure that you're getting that peak. For the sort of events that we are testing, where we're using um, synthetic products like rope, tape, webbing, all that sort of thing, if you're doing any sort of dynamic tests, you need to sample at at least 100 samples per second. When I do my drop tests, I sample at 2,000 samples per second and video them at 1,000 samples per second. That way I'm, I don't miss anything. Like I really can be sure that the peak that I've got, rather than saying, oh, yeah, it says it's 1.66 kilonewtons, but I want to be sure that the curve that I get when I plot it is this nice smooth curve and the number that I've got is really the number that I was hoping to, to measure. So the dynamic tests take a lot of, lot of effort to think about the design of. <clears throat> um, now I want to talk about what those numbers actually mean. And then there's, there's many different ways to interpret those numbers. And um, some of you have heard me talk about this stuff before, and that's this idea of a three sigma min, um, minimum breaking strength or... Um, mathematically or statistically, and I know some of you are a lot stronger in maths than, than I am, but three standard deviations less than the mean. Um, so, look, I'll just go quickly to another curve. And, again, this is in, in, in the notes that I've given you, so please don't, don't, don't stress about it if, if this is, you know, how am I going to remember this? You don't need to. It's just to try and put a bit of background in here. On this axis here, I've got the values of 25 through to 35 kilonewtons. I've made these curves up. These aren't from real tests. And on this axis, I've got the probability. A particular carabiner, and I'm not saying that black diamond one would have that curve, and I'd break enough of those carabiners to get a nice smooth curve, so I might break 100 carabiners. Um, I should get a curve like this where there will be an average value, and in this, on this curve here, the average is 30 kilonewtons, 
And by the time I get to 32 kilonewtons, there's no more. I mean, there might be one in a million. And less than 28 kilonewtons, there's, there's you know, I, I'm not having any that are breaking that week either. Whereas I might go to a different carabiner manufacturer and maybe their average is still 30, but some of them are breaking at 33 and some are breaking at 27. What's the difference there? And again, this is a trap that you might fall into because if you get a carabiner that says 30 kilonewtons on the spine, you get your load cell, not this one, and you break it and it says 33, their temptation might be to think it said 30, but it broke at 33, so this is a really good carabiner. All right, But in fact, to have this spread in the curve tells me that maybe their materials weren't as good and their production process wasn't so controlled because they've got such a big spread in where they all broke rather than all having one focused curve and breaking into one place. Um, I think it was DMM that was the first manufacturer that said, well, we need to be a little bit more scientific about this because the average breaking strength means nothing to us. Average, I mean, I, I could say, I mean, I think there's a lot of people in Switzerland here, I could say, you know, the Swiss education system, like I've, I've, I've heard that um, half the children in Switzerland are below average intelligence, you know. And, in fact, that's exactly right because the average, the average should be this value here. So half should be below and half should be above. Americans get really upset when I say that in presentations, you know. Hey, what are you talking about? But, um, yeah, it, it's... I mean, you can prove or disprove anything you like with statistics, and statistics is far from my strong point. Um, but so what DMM and Fred Hall at DMM, they came up with this idea, we need to have some indication of the width of this curve. Is it a nice narrow curve with a high peak or is it a flat one like this? And it's a fairly, fairly standard statistical treatment, this three sigma treatment. And what it's saying is basically if I... You can, you can get this value just by putting all of the numbers into a statistical analysis program and it will tell you what the standard deviation is. The standard deviation is indicative of how far the numbers that you measure are plus or minus of the average value on the curve. Um, <clears throat> sorry, we're struggling with focus a bit there again, aren't we? There we go. Um, so what the, what the three sigma MBS is means we, we get... The, the, the media, sorry, the, the, the mean value, and then we take off one, two, three standard deviations, and between plus and minus three standard deviations of the mean, 99.7% of the population should be somewhere in that band. And if we say that this number here, the mean minus three standard deviations, this is the crux of it, that's the number that we're going to write on the spine of the carabiner on the side of it. So it still doesn't guarantee that we might get one and a half in a thousand carabiners breaking below that MBS that's marked on it, because statistically we can never define what is that guaranteed minimum breaking strain. I'm always really nervous when I see manufacturers say the guaranteed minimum breaking strain is this number. They can't guarantee that. Statistically, there can still be like a few outliers that might break lower than that, okay? Um <clears throat> So that's what that number means for carabiners, right? Um, now, I've broken a lot of carabiners on, on my test bed. Um, and look, I'm just, gonna put, I'm just gonna put one up here, which is not broken, it's just stretched. It's just stretched enough. I like, I like stretching them as well. I actually find I learn more from pulling things to the point just before they break than trying to put the pieces back together afterwards and work out what happened, right? A lot of, it frustrates a lot of people in my tests and the videos that I put up. They say, man, why didn't you break it? We wanted to see it break, you know? But it's just I learn more about that, like what has happened in the nose here is that's opened up and let the nose come out of that section of the game. Um, and, in fact, it also explains why for some manufacturers you'll have a different strength rating for the screw gate version of exactly the same carabiner frame as an auto-locking version, for example, because this will constrain the spread of that section of the game. So even though the frame is the same, those ones are different, but you will get a different strength result depending on the gate mechanism there sometimes. Yeah? But aluminium 7075, T6, aluminium certainly does stretch. 
it doesn't snap without warning, which is what I hear a lot of people say about alloy, that general term, which really, I mean, most steels are alloys as well. Um, it's a very poor English, English term. But look, if I'm going to do any tests and interpret anything from the data, it's really useful to look at that before I do the test and go, if I'm going to do a, a UIAA test on this between two 10 millimeter pins and pull them apart at a controlled test rate, what's my prediction? How do I think? What is the mechanism that that's going to fail? And it, it sort of makes sense because like this pencil here, if I can pull this perfectly in tension, it's going to fail directly along that axis, like it is a simple structure. With the carabiner here, it's, it's one step off being simple because we're not loading it directly along the spine. We're pulling it in the, in the, the crotch and the, the basket there, and it's slightly off axis of the strongest part of that structure. So what is probably going to happen is either the nose is going to fail or the nose pin or the gate or the gate pin, and once that happens, it's going to allow that carabiner to open out and then it should fail either here or here. And because it's so symmetric along, along there, it's depending on which pin is further out here as to which one's probably going to break first. So it's really helpful when you're doing any testing to try and predict the mode of failure. And if it is fairly predictable and they are all breaking in that same place, so here we go, these, these were gate open tests. So I've confirmed that you know, if, if I do a, a gate open pull, that um, this pin can travel further towards the nose, so it's going to try and open that out, so it will probably fail here first. And that's what's happened with, with these samples. It's failed there. Um, if the gate is closed, then sometimes, and I, I haven't got another one just handy, but, you know, it, it, it might break here. Let's go at this end first. Every now and then I get a little bit surprised. But the key thing about that is, that confirms that when I do a bunch of tests, I should get a curve like this. So um, the, the standards and the way they're written, there's a, quite a bit of variation. And uh, like it's great that you guys are involved in standards as well, but the language that we use to put numbers on, on our expectations for these things, our minimum breaking strength, it's quite important. I think the EN norms, the European norms, the, the carabiner standards, either the mountaineering or the PPE ones, they, they give a minimum strength that each of the carabiner shapes should withstand in a test. The um, NFPA 1983, the American Firefighters Standard, they actually say this language of break five carabiners and do that three sigma treatment, statistical treatment of them, and determine that number, and they have to be above that. You know, So there's, there's different ways it's written. My problem, however is what happens when I go to something which is a more complex structure, something like a sewn sling, like this sling here. And this one must be 30 years old now. I've had that one since new. But if I was to, and I might just zoom out a little bit, but if I was to put that on the test bed, I'll go to that short Dyneema one because it'll all fit in frame easily, more easily. And I put that on the test bed and I start to pull, what is my prediction on the mode of failure? Well, it might be around one of the pins or it might be at the stitching. I'm not sure. I can't, with confidence, predict that it's going to be one or other, right? So, in, and in fact, um, what I might get is a bimodal distribution of the results rather than a normal or Gaussian distribution, you know, the, the standard normal curve that we see like this. So if I struggle to predict the failure point and maybe the stitching on this one is better so it goes stronger and breaks at one of the endpoints or maybe it's one of the ones where the stitching maybe it wasn't quite right and I get that variation if I have a bimodal or multimodal distribution in the results then I can't apply a three sigma treatment to, to, the, to the results because if I did that the standard deviation the mean is going to be here the standard deviation is going to be huge for these so that mean value there, that might be 30 kilonewtons, but by the time I apply that statistical, like that statistical treatment, three sigma might take that down to 10 kilonewtons. And that's why with the standards for slings and harnesses, they don't say to apply this statistical treatment. 
they actually say in um, uh, in EN three hundred and sixty six and three hundred and seventy five. Um, I think it's slightly different for the two, um, depending on whether it's an anchor device or or a, or a sling. You have to perform one test, and the value must be at least twenty two kilonewtons. And that's why it's no it's no coincidence that if I look at this sling here and flip the label over, it says 22 kilonewtons on the label here. I know, you're, sorry, you can't read that. You're going to have to take my word for it. But it says 22 kilonewtons on that sling. It also says 22 kilonewtons on this sling, on this sling, and pretty much every other sling that I can get from my set. It, they all say 22 kilonewtons on them. Now, if I put this one on my test bench, I bet it's going to be much stronger than 22 kilonewtons. Maybe it's 40 or 50 kilonewtons. I haven't broken one of these. Same with this. Same with this. I don't know what the strength was when they were new and, and what the manufacturer determined when they did that test. They might not have even broken it because all they have to demonstrate is that it is greater than 22 kilonewtons. All right? Um, this one, this is one of the few that, that has a higher number on it. I, I sort of showed some of you that one, this one last year. Um, this is 100 kilonewtons that they've got on this sling here. It's way stronger than the 22 kilonewtons, and they do say minimum brake load on that of 100 kilonewtons. But, you know, it's no coincidence. Like carabiners, they all have different numbers on because they do the tests and they give you that. Most manufacturers apply a three sigma MBS treatment to their carabiner ratings. But the slings... It's absolutely no coincidence that they write 22 kilonewtons on them all because that's the minimum that they need to adhere to to, um, to meet the standard. They maybe didn't even break them. Um, look, I'm conscious that, um, we're, that that's my half hour and I started a little bit early and I've gone a few minutes over as well. Um, as, as I'll say with any presentation, like send me questions anytime. Like I, I'm, I'm passionate about, about the safety of anyone that uses the products that we use. Um, whether it's rock climbing, slack climbing. I'm not a slack climber. I've never been. Um, I've done some dumb things. That's way smarter than some of the dumb, dumb things I've done, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but, look, if, you, if you've got any questions at any time about any of this stuff, I'm, like I, I pride myself in taking the time to get back to people. And if, if you take the trouble, if you go to the trouble of sending me an email to ask a question, then um, I'll, I'll go to the trouble of answering it as well. It's... It's, um, it's really important. I'm not employed by any manufacturer. I'm not sponsored by any manufacturer. Um, I'm just a, a, um, a, a sole trading hourly rate rope access technician um, and, and my family is, is my only boss. But um, <laughs> anytime. And thanks again for having me, guys. I, 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 I love presenting with you guys and spending time with you. And I, I can't wait to get back to Europe and, and other places where you might be. Thank you. Look for slow pull tests. Um, sometimes I even sample at two samples per second. It depends. It depends how slowly I'm pulling. Um, I think I can't remember. I think the, the slow sample rate on this is five samples per second. That's normally. And if I was doing if I was doing a whole lot of slow pull tests like cyclic loading, there's no way I'm going to sample at two thousand samples per second. Because, I mean, the first time using my load cell at samples at 2,000 samples per second, I was using an earlier version of Microsoft Office. In Microsoft Excel, I think there was a limit of 32,000 rows that you could import. 32,000 rows, if I'm sampling at 2,000 samples per second, gives me only 16 seconds of data. Right? If I'm doing cyclic loading of carabiners and looking at what happens with the stresses of loading and unloading Maybe it's a 24-hour test that I've got to run. I don't want to have gigabytes or terabytes of data that I'm having to post-process. So two samples per second is definitely appropriate for slow pool tests, five to be safe. Yep. Um, just reading the questions here. So maybe I'll ask the question. Yep. Um, uh, do you... Do you have for different products, do you have enough sample size to maybe determine how the curve looks? Like even for a carabiner, I would imagine that it's not exactly a symmetrical bell curve. It might be like sloped to one side or the other. Uh, do you have enough sample size for like specific type of carabiner to determine? I, I, I don't. I, I don't. And um, 
because everything I, again, it's part of my defense of being independent. Everything I break, generally I prefer to walk into a retail store where they don't know who, know who I am and purchase the products new um, and then do the tests. I don't want someone to say, hey, you only got, you only did those because they gave them to you and they wanted them to show you how good the results were. Yeah, so, um, look, I, I know... Um, I know many manufacturers, and I've visited the factories of Rock Exotica, of Petzl, um, of, um, uh, of DMM um, in Wales, uh, and many manufacturers, that, and they're amazing. The, the, all of the reputable brands, the ones that we know about, the effort that they put into this stuff, like uh, they know more about it than me, and, and I've, I do trust the, their approach to the science of that. Um, I've asked them questions um, like Rock Exotica, for example, they choose just because of that potential unknown one in one in um, you know one and a half in a thousand carabiners might break below that. Rock Exotica proof load one hundred percent of their carabiners to half of their MBS before they go out of the factory, and that's why with a, with a brand new Rock Exotica carabiner, if it's one of the the coloured anodised ones, if you look inside the basket and the crotch you'll see that the anodizing, you might look at it and go, hey, man, someone's already used that carabiner. It's because they put it on the test machine and loaded it to half the MBS, right? Um, and then there's other manufacturers like SMC in, in Washington State um, and Garen Wallace, who's a genius who doesn't work there anymore, unfortunately. Um, he said, yeah, I don't get why they do that because all they've done is that they've shown it will hold that once. Maybe they've unnecessarily fatigued that component and it means that, you know, like we shouldn't be loading those components that much. So, look, there's a whole lot I would like to know, but it's at the same time, um, given the constraints of, of what I what I can do with my time and money, um, I, I, I haven't looked uh, at a large population like that to determine the, how accurate that curve is. But I, I believe it's something like that. Oh, sorry, that was – and I said, have you ever had one fail below that, below that half-proof load? And they said, Never. Because to do that, there's probably a manufacturing or a material flaw and their inspections through the process is so thorough that it wouldn't make it to that stage of that half-proof load. Okay? So the curve probably is skewed to the, the higher end of good. Um, but that was, you know, they've, they've never written that down, um, but they, you know, they're happy to, happy to, to say that one. Go ahead and have it, I guess. <laughs> Hi, Richard. Uh, first of all, thank you, ISA, and thank you, Richard, for, for this. I mean, I look forward to this every year to meet so many uh, people who are so enthusiastic about breaking stuff and talking about sports and gear science. So, first of all, thank you. Uh, I actually wanted to know your opinion on one thing. I mean, it's amazing that I, again, still feel that ISA is uh, ahead of their time in terms of trying to standardize gear testing and labels because there still hasn't been enough accidents maybe uh, to sort of make you give a knee-jerk reaction, you know, that, oh, maybe we should do something about it. So I feel that ISA is ahead of the times already by doing that. Uh, but I ask you this question specifically because you have been into this field for quite some time in the rope and rope access conte uh, context, which is quite old. There's nothing brand new about, uh, you know, the gear which is being used. It's all been tested. There's a lot of uh, academics and theories already on that. So what I'm curious to know is I feel the MBS, once again, you have given an example that I didn't know about actually, that when we see MBS of one equipment and another equipment, like a sling versus a carabiner, we assume them to be the same thing, but they are like calculated in such a different uh, mm -hmm. formulas and different standards. So similarly, I and I believe it was you or uh, Mr. Walter last year who was talking about age of rope that is extremely arbitrary and there's no such thing as rope losing its strength over years. It's more about UV exposure or abrasion or friction, right? So I'm curious to know now ISA is uh, sort of setting new standards, whereas the in the world of rope, already standards have been set. In the context of webbing, already we are studying, I mean, the ISA is studying expo UV exposure. Uh, IC balance community even gives a rating for abrasion resistance. I don't know much about that. But it's we are acknowledging that there's so much more than MBS. MBS is a very limiting thing and it's not even communicated well to a consumer. So I'm curious to know that is there something changing in the rope world too 
because sport climbing now sport climbing is in the olympics slack lining every consumer the technical understanding of gear is getting lower and lower but the enthusiasm is getting higher and higher sure. so this kind of at least in india that's what i would like to say that we have a lot of people are very enthusiastic with less understanding of uh, what mbs means what kind of gear should be used etc so i'm curious to know if that conversation has happened in climbing it, it, it's, it's a really good question and it, it, it happens it happens all the time and look when i am um, I had a bad skiing accident and and had a complete re- reconstruction on my knee and I had to work in a retail shop this was when I was guiding I worked retail for 6 months and um like I'll never forget this conversation this guy comes into the shop this new young climber and says what's the strongest carabiner you've got and I said wow what are you going to use it for and he goes well it's going to be the one that I'm belaying with off my harness you know so that's the most important carabiner in the system and it, it was that's when I first started thinking about that it's so not about strength and and the other one that i get all the time is people say is a bow line better than a figure of eight or 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 vice versa and it's just like you know what what do you want to use it for is the most important question because it's all strong enough and uh, unfortunately i'm involved in many accident investigations um it's not something i choose to do but people ask my opinion on these things often um and most of them because it's it's in a work context most of them never get reported publicly because there's it's always because someone has made a mistake it's never because something is not strong enough you know um and if someone's made a mistake it doesn't make sense that it goes to a legal finding it's much better if there's a settlement before it gets to that and often as part of that financial settlement everyone has to sign a statement of confidentiality but i i can say it's never about strength it's always about you know people having made a mistake um the 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 aging of slings and ropes but Walter has done some mag- some really really good work there you know far far more than me and i don't know the answer to that question i i really don't um i do know in in rope access with the work that i do um i do so much of that work and my colleagues that i don't have any soft products apart from ones that i keep for sentimental value i don't have anything older than 10 years it doesn't last that long because i use it all that much I've, I had a kilometer of 1000 meters of rope in my car the other day for a job you know and it's like all of that rope is is less than less than 5 years old um and and some of it is near the end of its usable life just because I use all of that equipment so much um but the the I, I prefer not to touch on the lifespan stuff um but probably one thing I would say is I don't know that anything that's broken simply because it's old and resulted in someone dying. I I I have he go I'll admit this it's even being recorded isn't it I have um some Edelred static rope that's more than 10 years old that I used to set up top rope anchors for climbs that my children climb on <laughs> No I I think rope's pretty good the flat slings and I think Walter you probably agree with me flat slings are, are probably inappropriate for most things but unfortunately you guys are sort of stuck with that technology so you need to be pretty careful with the uv and other exposures of, of that sort of product <laughs> uh yeah if, not, if nobody else has i have one um so i've been thinking about this a long time um and it has really it's also related to like the the mbs actually a lot of products doesn't say much for me it's like you said you richard you like to pull things until they start to fail and actually that's the most important part actually when like that's why i like the products that mention the working load for me that's the most important thing actually the working load because i have the idea that if you put a working load it probably means that if you yeah, that's that's rule if you use it above the working load something will start to fail it will not break like suddenly because you have the mbs which is five or 10 or whatever and this is uh, standards higher but you don't want it to break so you want it to use your product afterwards still normally so yeah. i mean that's why i'm always going like like the, the, uh, i'm actually like why don't they put a working load on the carabiner and stop using the mbs because actually the working load might tell you when the gate will start to fail and you have the time to get off your rope or to 
stop using your product before it fails. And Johan, it's one of my favorite questions. I'll, I'll send the money to you for asking that. It's it's, it's <laughs> perfect. Um, look, there's only one manufacturer that I know of that, that comes close to specifying that for recreational rock climbing and, and industrial um, products, and that's Kong. And Kong, in their manual for all of their hardware, they say never exceed 25% of the MBS that's marked on that piece of equipment. Mm-hmm. And I've spoken to my friends at Kong about that, and like a, they, a, 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 I love meeting up with those guys every time I see them. Ettore is, is, a, is a very intelligent man. And I said, Ettore, why, why do you say that in the instructions? And, uh, and he said, I think you know. And I said, it's fatigue, yeah? <laughs> and, and what they're saying basically is with this device here, if that was a Kong carabiner, Kong says, in your, if that's a 30 kilonewton carabiner, and this isn't, this is a 25 kilonewton black diamond carabiner, <laughs> it should never exceed seven and a half kilonewtons on that, on the loading of that carabiner. If you stay below seven and a half kilonewtons, then you won't impact the fatigue life of that, of that device. And particularly because it's aluminium and fatigue influences aluminium components, it's cumulative, much worse than, than with steel products. Um, so, look, it's getting towards that. I, I'm with you, Johan. I would much rather we're told what the working load limit on these devices is because I don't think we're smart enough to use the MBS correctly. Like, it, we should never – most people, like, if, if I say that carabiner says 30 kilonewtons on it, what does that mean? They say that they can put 30 kilonewtons on it. It doesn't mean that at all. It means you should be able to do that once, but maybe on the second time with 30 kilonewtons it will fail. I know on the first time, and this is one of my favourite sets of carabiners that I have, um, this is, and I'll put it on the other camera, um, this is what this carabiner looks like when it's new. This is what it looks like when it's been loaded to 18 kilonewtons. The rating on this is 22 kilonewtons. This is what it looks like when I pulled it to 22 and a half kilonewtons. So... You, I, I'm not sure, but I hope you can see that, and there's pictures of this in the notes in the reference that I gave you, the shape of this carabiner is already different to that one. It's longer and it's compressed. So it has undergone plastic, sorry, it's just a little bit out of frame. It's undergone plastic deformation. Elastic deformation means I stretch it and I let go and it goes back to the original shape. Plastic means it's got, undergone irreversible change. As soon as I've done that, I've significantly reduced the number of cycles that that carabiner can withstand in its life. I've done a couple of um, fatigue testing on, on carabiners, and I, oh man, I, I've got a good friend, Hannes Seibert from Rock Exotica Europe in, in Berlin, and he hosted a, a, a testing workshop that I ran there five years ago now, and Fred Hall from DMM came with a bag full of DMM carabiners, you know. And look, we set up... We set, we set up the cyclic loading machine, the, the pull test machine that he's got, which is all computer controlled, to, to get a DMM carabiner and load it and relax and load it and relax. Take two seconds to load it up, a second to let it relax, two seconds to load it up. And we went to 80% of the MBS, right? So if it was a 22, 24 kilonewton carabiner, I mean, we went to about 18. And it broke on the 400th cycle. So by loading it repetitively to 80% of its MBS, it failed on the 400th, about 400th cycle. If we took it to 10% of its MBS, I wouldn't have been able to pay the rent on that machine in that building waiting the years for it to break, right? Fatigue testing takes a lot of time and it's very expensive with the equipment that it ties up. But I'd love to know more about the fatigue testing of of hardware. Software, look, I don't want to steal the thunder of... um, stretch and measuring stretch and all that sort of stuff. I wish I could be here to, there to hear some of that because it, it, it's something that not enough people, this term viscoelasticity, I think you might come up with that um, in the presentation a little bit later. It's a really important thing when we're looking at stretch and how long it takes materials to recover. Um, I'll certainly be looking at the, at the recording of that one later. I hope that goes somewhat towards answering the question, Johan, but I absolutely agree. Work mode limit for me is much better. In Europe, I think you've got this problem with the PPE directive as opposed to the machinery directive, and they've got quite different requirements for the specifications between work mode limit and MBS. Thanks a lot, Rick. All right. 
Yeah, thanks, Richard. That's it. Yeah, thank you. My two cents on the working load limit is that I like, especially in slacklining, but I'm also pretty sure in the whole rope access and climbing um, world, we have the problem that most people, more than 95% of the people using the gear have no idea of the forces. So they cannot relate it to any uh, working load limit. Like it's easy with a lifting sling where it says like one ton working load limit and you know how heavy something is and you can just yeah. lift it with that. But in our context with dynamic forces, that's super difficult. And that's actually also why we decided not to put working load limits in our standards anymore. Uh, we just use the MBS. We don't specify that the manufacturer has to give a working load limit. They can if they want. But at the end of the day, like who knows the forces, you know, in our systems, you have to be experienced. You need to own a, a load cell. You need to know lots of background stuff to yeah. a proper load cell. Yeah. To really complicated. These things. Yeah, so it's, it's complicated. Yeah. And, and actually what yeah. Kong does with the carabiners, in my opinion, is very critical for slacklining when they say like seven kilonewton is okay. But if you have two to seven kilonewton cyclic loads on this, 30 kilonewton aluminum carabiner, you're going to break it quickly. Yeah. So also and you guys are doing that more than anyone else. Yeah. For sure. So yeah. also with those, this 25%, and I was also talking to the, the Mr. from Kong about this, it's not going to be good enough for us. It's maybe good for like some static force in a rescue scenario or something like yeah. that in, in rope access, but it's not good enough for slacklining. So we still have this problem and that's I think why we also don't want to work with a working load limit in slacklining right now because it's just not enough knowledge around about forces involved in slacklining. I, I know there was one, um, Walter, maybe you know more about this, did we, and maybe we even spoke about it last year, but Petzl had to revise their Flying Fox pulleys. Um, I think they had an aluminium connector, an aluminium component, and it was just from people running down that flexible steer wire rope and the vibrations just with a single bike, single person's weight on them, the fatigue of that repetitive loading and unloading, like thousands of cycles a day, um, actually meant they had premature failure of connectors um, in, in that. It, there is a report somewhere on the, that, that the theme parks, or sorry, the, 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 the rope access section on the Petzl website, which is very hard to find, they did have a, a, a recall or a report on that for the, the tandem speed pulleys and the connectors that go on them. Yeah, but I, I agree. And that's like you guys, it's, it's great. Um, you know, I stick up for slackliners all the time because people think, oh, what are those guys doing, you know, loading these things up? And I go, man, speak to some of the guys that I spend some time with and they're smarter than, than any of the people that are generally. I mean, I've got a couple of geniuses that I bounce ideas off in the rock climbing community as well, but you guys have so got your shit together and so ahead of the curve with the standards. It's such a good thing, you know, if you can stay ahead of that. And like every question that someone asks, you've, you've probably already thought of that question and come up with a bunch of answers, which is, which is awesome. Thanks a lot, Richard, for all these nice words. Um, <laughs> um, so I think we're going to let you go from here on. Um, we will have um, some interesting talks on cyclic loading, fatigue, and also stretch curves, dampening of webbing in the afternoon, uh, starting at um, 2.30 p.m. CEST. And the next talk will be at 12.30, so approximately in a half an hour on Slackline Park's infrastructure, um, anchors, forces, and how to convince a city to build those, so a completely different topic. But um, to end this, thanks a lot, Richard, for your time, for um, joining this event. I think uh, we'll have lots of clicks on the recorded video <laughs> because it's a super interesting and important topic. And thanks, everybody, for joining. And hope to see you again in about a half an hour. Grab a cup of coffee or some lunch. Or dinner. Or dinner, wherever you are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for having me again, you guys. I'm going to leave you at that. It's 8 o'clock here, and I'll get up at 5 o'clock in the morning for, for, for my work tomorrow. But I look forward to catching up with you um, maybe tomorrow, um, but certainly for some of the recordings. And hopefully when I get to travel to Europe again next, I really miss my European friends, that's for sure. Mm -hmm.